I gotta pray. Our Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, Lord, I want you to come out, not me. And I pray for my preacher friends, bless their hearts, that you gave them a thought. And bless, who are we? I love you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. And um, chapter 5 of uh, Luke, this was preached. I told the pastor about this this morning. Um, it was preached about, uh, and I need to read it in order to get to my point. It's um, Luke chapter 5, verse 17 through 25. I'll read fast. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that they were that the Pharisees and the doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and to the power of the Lord was present to heal them and behold men brought in a bed a man which was taken with palsy and sought means to bring him in and lay him before him and when they could not find by and, and when they could not find by the way that they might find him being because of the multitude they went upon the housetop and they let him down through the tiling with his couch and with the mist before Jesus and when they saw their faith he said unto them man thy sins be forgiven thee and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying who is this which speaketh blasphemies who can forgive sins but God only but when Jesus perceived that their thoughts and answering said unto them what reason why reason ye in your hearts whether it is easier to say thy sins be forgiven or to say rise up and walk but they but that they may know that the son of man hath power upon the earth forgive their sins he said unto the sick of the palsy I say unto thee arise take up thy couch and go into the to the house and immediately he rose up before them and took up what he lay and departed to his own house and glorified God and I'm telling you what I seen that word immediately and it stuck out like a sore thumb and I'm telling you I, it was just awesome because the Lord showed that to me immediately. It's, it's hard telling how many times we've read that. Immediately it just stuck out in my head. And I did a, a word study. I remember the pastor saying, you ought to do a word study. In the New Testament, there's 55 instances it affected people. Inst and immediately I thought, oh my gosh, look at this. He's giving it to me. And I thought it was so awesome. And immediately, the definition, it means at once. Instantly. But for this man to recognize, he had to recognize his position. You, we don't know how long he was in a position like this. But he had four good friends. Yeah. They took him to Jesus. He didn't go to the priest. Right. He went to Jesus. Yeah. That's what we need to do. We need to go to the, uh, um, to the altar like the preacher preached this morning and give it to Jesus. Yeah. This, he, this man recognized to receive Jesus Christ, you have to recognize that you're at your lowest state. Jesus' greatest priority was ministering to the so-called notorious sinners, the social outcasts. That's what I was because they admitted the lowly state, the helpless position that we, I was in. The Pharisees are just the opposite. They're sinners, but they don't want to admit it. Because of their self-righteousness, their self-sufficiency, Jesus could do nothing. If you don't come to Jesus at your lowest state, he can't help you. He cannot help you at all. But there's a few other instances that i got to tell you about. In Matthew chapter 4, you don't have to go there. Matthew chapter 4. Now, before I get to Matthew chapter 4, there's different stages of immediately that I have to tell you about because what worked for the palsy man is going to be different for other people. And immediately they responded to it. But now we got to go to, uh, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but it's in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 4. It is in verse, Matthew 4, uh, verse, no, wait a minute, come on, come on, 18, verse 18 and 22. And Jesus, walking by the sea in Galilee, saw the brethren, Simon had called Peter and Andrew, the, his, bro his brother, casting a net into the sea, and they were fishers. And they said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway, that's another form of immediately. 
And they left their nest and they followed him. And going on from thence, he saw the other two brethren, James and the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, and a ship with Zebedee and their father, mending their nets, and he, and he called them. And immediately they left the ship and their father, and he followed them. They dropped it all for Jesus Christ. Bless the Lord. In Luke 8, 43, in Luke 8, 43, we talks about the woman with the issue of blood. And and but I, I have to read this first and behold there came a man named Jairus and he was a ruler of the synagogue and he fell on his, Jesus feet and besought him that he would come to his house for he had one only daughter and at the 12 years old and she lay a dying but as he went to the people and thronged him then there's a sick and a woman having an issue of blood 12 years and she had all her living upon physicians she spent all her living on physicians neither could they heal of any came behind him and touched him the border of his garment and immediately her issue of blood stench in other words it stopped she came immediately like I said before she didn't go to no priest what she could have I don't know but it didn't do no good until she came to Jesus until she came to Jesus and we have blind Bartimaeus and Jesus said unto him go thy way thy faith hath made thee whole Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus Christ. And then we have the book of Acts in chapter 16. The jailer got saved. I won't read it, but due to time. And as he got so involved in it, his whole household got saved. And straightway, he, they, all got in, they, they all got into the Lord and blessed the Lamb of God. I tell you what, when you turn your life over to Jesus Christ... You're saying that your life is unmanageable and it's time to, you have to have, I, I was telling Kaylee, I said, do you know the definition of manage and unmanageable? And that's what my life was. I, I could not, I couldn't manage it until you give it to Jesus. Amen. Bless the Lamb of God. And for by grace of God, I, I am what I am. Paul said that in chapter 15, verse 10 by his grace bestowed upon me and, it, and he was not in vain bless the Lamb of God I tell you what sinner friend if you're, you can come to Jesus immediately because that's how quick he works bless the Lord 2nd <laughs> Peter chapter number 1 2nd Peter chapter number 1 I'll read the first four verses. The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained, like precious faith, with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you and through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given us unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, introduction, three quick things. Verse number one, you see the converted. Simon Peter writes to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. Who's that? That's the saved. Those that have received Christ and been converted, like he just talked about, instantly, immediately, right, changed into that new creature. Then in verse number 3, I want you to see the call. Everybody that's saved, God has the same call for them, that He hath called us to glory and virtue. Two attributes that man does not naturally possess. Two attributes that can only be attributed to a person through God. Right? We are robed in His, it is bestowed upon us, it is not something that we produced on our own. Same is true of glory and virtue. But then finally, I want you to notice verse number four, the course or the way that we achieve that call, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How do we obtain glory and virtue? We embrace the fact that as a new creature, he desires us to be partakers of his divinity. We are not divine, but we can 
taste the fruit of the divine. We cannot be holy, but we can have a little bit of holiness. Because we are His, we are entitled to everything that is His. Even though we cannot duplicate it, we cannot produce it on our own, we can be partakers of it. And as you heard on Wednesday night, as I was studying this out and brought back that story, there was a time you pushed me around in a grocery store in a cart, I'd just start singing, standing on the promises. Why? It's my favorite hymn. Still is to this day. But as I'm reading these verses, we could stand on the promises, but because of the promises, with the Lord's help, we're going to preach on partaking by the promises. Partaking by the promises. Partaking, meaning that that's the means that God desired for us to partake of His divine nature, of glory and of virtue. Now, definition of partaker, like Brother Phil, a partaker is somebody that gets but didn't start the partaker was not the one that initiated it. The partaker is given or asked or entrusted to help become a part of something, but they were not the one that initiated it. Because of the promises of God, as we're going to show here in a second, we don't have time to get through all the promises of God. We're only going to look at three. One, because of time, and two, because y'all don't want to be here until next July 4th. And then some. Right? But the promises of God are the mechanism by which we but we have to become part you have to choose a partaker does you cannot partake if you're inactive you have to choose first to receive but then you have to choose to apply whether it's food somebody can lay a meal out in front of you you don't need it you're not a partaker right if you don't receive it and accept and then go ahead and make it a part of you you can accept anything that you want to but unless you use it you're not a partaker you're just a freeloader right? but three promises real quick that show how God intended all of his promises every single one of them that he exalted above his own name are meant for us to become partakers of his divinity okay first let's look at the spirit the greatest gift, the greatest promise that God ever gave, I, I do reckon, would be the fact that when Jesus said, when He went away, that the Comforter would come. Now you say, why is that so special? Because before that, God had never indwelled man. But since then, study it out through the book of Acts and the you know, process that God took salvation from what it was to where we are today, instantly, you begin, and immediately the Holy Ghost moves in. Right? How much more of a partaker of His divinity can you be than Him being inside of you? Right? The Word spiritually discerned. He gave you divine understanding of the Word if you apply yourself and become a partaker of it. Through the Holy Ghost, we have divine transmission of our prayers directly into the throne room of God. We have someone that can pray the prayers that we don't even you know, have the comprehension to pray. We take those groanings and utterings to the throne. But yet so often we think of the Holy Ghost as you know, a thing or a seal on our soul that keeps us from being defiled. We think of Him as a mechanism and not a person. There's so much divinity that God would have us be partakers so that we can be called and accomplish that call to glory and virtue. What mechanism do you think He uses for that? The promise that He would send the Comforter. Jesus said it's better for the Comforter to come than Jesus to stay here on earth. Why? Because it was God's divine plan that you could be partakers of His divinity because He took root in you. All the fruits are not of us. It's because of the seed that He put in us and we allowed to grow out. But not only the Spirit. Think of supplication. What better way to partake of divinity than supping with or face to face, eye to eye, with the Lord Jesus Christ through the Word, through prayer, through preaching, through meditating on the things of God. But those moments where it's so intimate between you and Him. I'll remind you when He wrote to the churches in the book of Revelation, He said, I stand at the door and knock. He's not talking to lost folk. talking to saved folk. talking to a called out, visible New Testament church saying that there was no place for it. But He said, if any man open, He'd come in and sup with him. What's that? Personal, intimate time. You know what's going to help you a whole lot more than Dr. Phil or uh, 
Oprah or chicken soup for whatever in the world's going on in your life? Like coming face to face with a thrice holy God, knowing that one, He cares about you, but also He cares enough that He wants to give you the answer that you need. Whether it's a hand to calm you, whether it's a hand to lift you up, if we receive it immediately, your mindset, your disposition, your situation is going to turn around. Nothing may have changed, but just knowing that God cares enough that He wants to get this close to you. Partakers of divinity. But then finally, the, as we heard about this morning, not consecration, but sanctification. How can we expect the Holy Ghost to have free reign to do as He will? How can we expect to have supplication with the Holy God unless first we are sanctified according to His purpose? I can polish myself up all I want to, but unless I'm polished by the One who knows what I need to be, it's all in vain. I can get up and preach whatever I want to, sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. We can get up and sing what we would want to sing, Right? In the, eye, in the ears of God, it's all disorder and chaos unless it's done in spirit and in truth. How do we do in spirit and in truth? We must be sanctified. How can I have fellowship with the Holy Ghost when my lifestyle grieves His very presence in my life? How can I expect to draw nigh to God and want to sup with Him knowing that there's something that He's not happy with? It's not going to happen. But what is the promise? That if we confess, He forgives. That if, like he said, if we come humbly, if we come low, if we come in the right mode, if we draw nigh to Him, He will draw nigh to us. But if we put on a front, He's near those of the contract spirit, but He resisteth the proud. Gives grace to the humble. It is through sanctification that God prepares us to receive the fulfillment of His promises. God promised that He would, but we've got to be prepared to receive God will not waste his promises God will not let his word be mocked you either do it God's way or it's not done at all it is through sanctification that we show God that we are truly serious about his promises I mean that's just three of them we don't have time to get into the rest of them but the promises of God every single one of them God intended not just for you to believe that that's what God said but to believe it enough that you stake your life on it. In order to be a partaker of His divinity, you have to live, not using these as a fallback plan, but instead staking your life on the very promise of God. If it makes sense or if it doesn't make sense. Right? Applying. the pro- Living like you believe the promises. Praying like you believe God's going to hear it and answer it. Worshiping like you believe that God wants you to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Right? Listening to the Holy Ghost, to the preaching, however you're receiving the Word, but listening as if God penned it just for you because He did. Believing that when He said that He will do, maybe not in my time, but maybe in His time, but when it is God's time, how's He do it? Immediately. Why was this all this written? So that we would believe that He was who He said He would and that He would do what He said He'd do. But if we shut the promises and we buy into Christianity is just a bunch of acts or it's what we do. No, 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 no. If you want to be virtuous, if you want to have godliness, if you want to be partakers of divinity, how do we obtain that? By living like we believe what God said He would do, who He was, and how He wants us to live. So many, here's your handkerchief, Jordan. So many fail to grasp what is really available, and that is an intimate, personal relationship with the Lord. He's more than just God, He's more than God out there. He is your personal Savior. But that's just the starting point. 
then a relationship is cultivated as long as you receive, believe, and stand on the promises. Amen. When you put them into action, the relationship is cultivated and grows stronger, and your faith grows because you believe in what thus saith the Lord. Thirty-two years ago, Miss Annette and I took vows or promises and pledges of our love to one another. But that was just the starting point. It's been cultivated for 32 years. I wonder how is your relationship with Jesus? Is he just the Lord? Or is he, as David said, my shepherd? He can be your shepherd too, but he's my shepherd. Hmm? I've said this before. We can be down separate Owls at Kroger's or Walmart. I know where she's at because I, I, I hear her walking. I know the sound of her walk. I know her touch. I know her voice. I know. How much do I know about Jesus? Do I know when he's walking by? Do I know his voice? Do I know his touch? You ought to. Amen. And you can. Because of those precious promises. All right, Brother Josh, you come. I'm glad Miss Tina got to come and hear you. See if I'd have done you first. <laughs> That's what she said. She said, I'll give you a 20 if you put him up so I don't have to hear him. So I hear him all the time. <laughs> Amen. Romans chapter number 8. I do want to thank Pastor for this opportunity. And I do request your prayers for the jail. I asked Brother Ogle this morning how he was able to get in. And he said he kind of did the same thing I've done. Just keep emailing. Just keep talking to them. So you just pray that um, last we knew, hopefully in August, that that stays the course and we get to go back here in around a month or so. Romans chapter number 8. We're going to start reading in verse number 16. Read three verses. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for the reading of your word. Lord, we thank you again, as our pastor talked about at the beginning of service, Lord, that we're in church tonight, Lord, that we have a church, that, Lord, we didn't take a holiday. Uh, Lord, we're just so thankful to be able to come and worship you tonight and celebrate these freedoms, Lord, that we have. I ask you just help what you've laid upon my heart. Lord, help me convey it here to the people the way you gave it to me and be helped to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The first thing I want to look at by way of introduction real quick is we see the challenge, so to speak, in verse number 17. It talks about, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. The challenge being how hard it is sometimes for us to accept that, uh, that suffering. Even though I truly believe when you read about what some of our forefathers went through and what some of those saints that came through before us, we don't suffer. You know, I don't know how many times and how many trips that I have been out on, uh, on visitation on Monday nights or back before on Friday mornings, Brother Phil, and the worst I've ever had anybody do is just tell me no. They're not interested. That's it. But yet we claim that we suffer. So we see the challenge and also want to look in verse number 18, the comparison. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That should be enough right there to make a shout. The fact that no matter what it is that we go through in this world, no matter what it is that we're faced with in this life, it fails to compare the glory that we will see one day in our Lord. But the thought that I want to get to tonight comes from verse number 16. It says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I got to thinking about that Thursday at work, um, and that children of God phrase I can find is found nine times in the Bible including Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 26. It says, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. If we are here tonight and we're saved, we are considered children of God. And I got to thinking about our children. If you don't have children, you, you've probably been around kids enough to know some of these things I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to go over a few things and just ask you a simple little question at the end. But in Matthew chapter number 18 and verse number 3, the Bible tells us, And said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall, know, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. What do children do? Our kids just trust us. Children just trust. 
They, they, they don't question things, Brother Phil. They don't, uh, they, they don't wonder uh, what's going on. Just whatever we tell them, Brother James, they'll just end up doing. Not only do they trust, our children also just have faith. Now, one time I grew up and it didn't have a lot of, uh, of money, but at never one time that I give a thought, Brother Jack, to what was going to be on my table the next day. Never once did I give a thought to what food was coming or anything like that. Not only do children just trust, not only do they have faith, but they also simply follow. You know, I've seen one of the little memes one time about uh, a dad telling his son to, uh, to watch where he walks and watch what he may get into. And the son tells his dad, hey, you watch where you walk because I'm following in your footsteps. They're just willing to follow us. How many times can you look at your kids? And we've even talked about... Um, uh, Bella did it a whole lot more than ever. Remember Caitlin doing it as much, just say certain phrases and things like that. And then after she says it a few times, you realize she's just repeating what we say. You know, probably right, Bella. Probably, probably right. Probably. Just certain that that's a big thing now. Probably, yeah, yeah, probably. And you realize how much they just simply follow. But then what happens to our kids? They do those things as they're younger. We do those things also in Christ that when we're when we're born again and we get saved we just want to follow we just have faith we just trust God's going to take care of us and then what happens our kids outgrow us this isn't this I told I got the, the blessing to teach the teens class this morning I told them this wasn't towards any of them but they become teenagers all of a sudden they just outgrow us they become teenagers they have all the answers I don't need mom and dad I, I know I know what's right I know I know what's going on they think they have all the answers. Not only do they have all the answers, if there happens to be something they don't know, they're going to hang out with their friends and seek their advice. Get that worldly advice. I don't want to know what mom and dad have. I'm going to find out what, what, what Joe here or, or, or whatever it may be. I'm going to seek their advice on what they think because their mom and dad's not as strict as mine is. Their mom and dad don't make them do the things that mine make me do. They'll seek their advice. Not only that, they will highlight their future. They know what they're going to do, Brother Jordan. I know exactly everything I'm going to do in my life. I got it all laid out in this nice little eight-step plan, giving no, th no thought to what God has us to do. How many times do we get like that in our walk with Christ? What do we need to do? As Brother Phil talked about a little bit, we need to be, learn to mature in the Lord. When we mature, we learn to appreciate things a little differently. You know, maybe when they get up and they get out of college or they get past them teenage years or we get past that little spell where we've just started going through the motions and that apathy kind of sets in. We get past that and we mature in the Lord. Our search changes. We're not searching the things of the world. We begin to search the Scriptures. We begin to get in His book and search the Scriptures. Why? Because we want to seek His advice. We realize as we grow older, our parents knew things we should have sought their advice. Why? It's not because our parents knew it all. It's not because they were smarter than anybody else. It's because they've been there. They've lived it. What better person to seek advice and seek answers from than the God of heaven who knows our future? He knows our future, which tells us that we begin to then see his future for our lives. I remember, and I still will stand by it. I, I remember we had, used to have the totes around here, and I signed a blank piece of paper and put it in there, just God, whatever you have for my life. Whatever it is you want me to do. I'll sit right here on this church pew and, and do absolutely nothing if that's what you want me to do. God, just whatever you want me to do, that's what we should seek, Brother Phil. That's what we should seek for our life. Humble ourselves and seek God. So a simple question for you tonight. Just outline just a few things, a simple question. Have you outgrown God or have you matured in the Lord since you've been saved? I'm done, Brother Doug. heard it put it like that, but that's a pretty good application right there. It's amazing, by the time they're 16, they know everything in the world, but when they, by the time they turn 21, they realize how intelligent their parents were. <laughs> yeah, give him two thumbs up, Bella. He did good. He probably did good, Bella. That was good. Well, I wasn't going to preach. I really wasn't. But I'm just going to give you the introduction of something I've got. Just a little simple. But it's something that uh, I just can't get away from. So take your Bibles, turn to John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. Kind of goes with some of the things that have been said. 
appreciate our preachers. Amen. Appreciate that they study. Appreciate that when they get up, they have something to say. And uh, I appreciate that. I, I'm glad we have these men uh, that help in the ministry here at the church. Now, let me say this. Um, a lot of young preachers kind of do what Brother Josh just said. You know, they got it all mapped out, what they think they're supposed to be doing in the ministry. And there's a push nowadays. I don't know where it comes from. I'm, I'm trying to find out. I'm talking to other preachers. We all see the same thing. A lot of these young, younger preachers, they're bypassing what's been outlined in the book and developing this new mindset for ministry. Uh, there's a popular push for these young preachers, just ignore your pastor, do what you feel like you need to do. I'm here to tell you, a man that won't submit to authority, God will never put him in a position of authority. Uh, I don't care if you're a preacher, if you've been saved 50 years, if you've been saved five months. The man of God that God has placed you under is the most important voice in your life. He watches for your soul. When you're sleeping, a lot of times he's not sleeping. And just as Brother Josh preached, he watches and he can watch you start to drift. And he begins to pray and labor with the Lord so you'll get back on center because he knows what's happen what happens if you drift too far. And so there's a lot of dangerous things out there, and a lot of these young preachers think they can bypass the pastor because they know more than him. Uh, but God's got a way of straightening all that out. But I'm seeing a lot of these young preachers, boy, they, they just, they're, they're living in rebellion to the things of God. Uh, see, if you, if you ignore your preacher, you also don't, don't understand the importance of the local church. Uh, listen, the local church is God's agency or God's government on earth. Anything that bypasses the local church is wrong. And there's a lot of folks uh, jacked up, messed up out there. But I'm glad we got some preachers that respect their preacher, uh, that love the church, and that uh, uh, certainly are a blessing to the church. John chapter number 1. I'm just going to give you a little thought. Verse 45. Philip findeth Nathaniel. And saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And can I say, I, I just envisioned Philip like a lot of us when we first got saved, we couldn't wait to tell somebody. Uh, Philip didn't know everything, but he knew that he'd met the right one. Hmm? Look at verse number 46. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. So I just want to give you a little thought out of these verses that the Lord just kind of gave me. Again, this was going to be an introduction to a message, but it's a little thought. Uh, let me show you, first of all, Christianity at work. There's a lot of people who claim to be Christian. You hear Christian used a lot. But can I say Christianity is a whole lot more than you going to church. We find Christianity at work uh, in these verses. First of all, notice the interaction needed. Verse 45, it says, Philip findeth Nathaniel. Christianity would have never got out of the first century church unless folks went and told somebody who they met. He went and found Nathaniel. You know why a lot of churches are drying up and why a lot of churches are closing the doors? Uh, why a lot of churches were dead long before COVID showed up? They've quit going. They're sitting here waiting for folks to just barge and break down the doors and come and hear about Jesus. It's never been that way. It'll never be that way. But I tell you what, we'll, we'll get them to the house of God. You go out and you start telling them, and if you start living a life before them that shows them something they don't have, uh, then the house of God get on fire. Uh, listen, uh, 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 when something's on fire, people show up and watch it burn. Hmm? We see the interaction needed. 
Now listen, you don't need to be a Bible scholar to tell somebody about Jesus. All you got to do is like Nathan, uh, Philip told Nathaniel here. He just told him what he knew. He said, we found him. Come and see. There's the interaction. I mean, I don't see Philip giving a big uh, 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 doctrinal thesis on who Jesus was. I don't see Philip quoting half the Bible. I just see Philip telling what he knew. And all you need to do is tell folks what Jesus done for you. We see the interaction needed. Notice the instrument uh, of Christianity. And look what he says in verse 45. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of, of Joseph. Uh, uh, the instrument uh, or the focus uh, or the central theme of Christianity is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, he's the one we talk about. He's the one that changed my life. He's the one we worship. He's the one we sing about. He's the one we preach about. He's the one we pray to. Uh, he's the one that wrote the promises. Uh, he's the one that changes things immediately. Uh, and He's the one that's going to soothe the sufferings now uh, and then reveal the glory when we get to heaven. He's the very instrument of Christianity. No Jesus, no Christianity. Mm. We see the interaction needed. We're talking about Christianity at work. We see the instrument up. But then we see the invitation to. Hmm? Look what he says. Come and see. Hmm? Hey, it's not real tough just to ask people to come to church. Now, they may not come. You may ask them and ask them and ask them and ask them. Just keep asking them. And if they won't hear you, go find somebody else and ask them. And then go find somebody sooner or later somebody's going to come and see this one named Jesus. Huh? Listen, I don't know how we get folks from where we get folks. But I do know that we got folks who go out and invite folks to come corporately uh, when we go out knocking on doors. And I know that there's a lot of folks on their job and a lot of folks in their neighborhoods and a lot of folks with their friends. They say, wait, you need to come to church. Uh, come to church. Uh, and sooner or later, they'll come or God will send somebody because he honors faithfulness. In these verses, we find Christianity at work. But I want you to notice the confrontation. Look at verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him. And saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Hmm? Now notice the confrontation. First of all, Nathanael uh, is confronted by Jesus. No one will ever get born again until Jesus speaks to their heart. Hmm? Notice uh, Jesus didn't talk to Nathaniel about uh, uh, John or James or Matthew or Luke. or And Jesus talked to Nathaniel about Nathaniel. And can I say before you get saved, you've got to realize Jesus is talking to you about you. Hmm? There's a confrontation. Nobody's ever going to come to the Lord unless he's confronted by the Holy Ghost of God. And can I say this after that? Then Nathaniel confronts Jesus. He begins to ask questions, uh, begins to talk and uh, ask about that. And listen, uh, before you got saved, uh, you started wondering and pondering in your heart, uh, uh, well, I thought I was a good person. Uh, 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 do I need to be saved? And then the Holy Ghost said, yes. Uh, and uh, uh, the conversation uh, uh, begins to start between you and the Lord. might have been an argument. I don't need I'm good enough as I am. I've been baptized. And the more you talked, the more he convicted you in the confrontation uh, until you came uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we see Christianity at work. We see the confrontation or the confronting. But then we find uh, the conversion. Look at verse 49. Nathaniel answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, or Master, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. You see, when you confront the Lord after he's confronted you, you'll come to the point where you realize he's God. Hmm? I mean, Nathaniel, ask him, do I know you? 
No, you don't know him, but he knows a whole lot about you. He knows the number of the hairs on your head, knows the thoughts and intents of your heart. He knows when you was formed in the belly. He knows everything about you, friend. Mm. Matter of fact, if I was going to preach, I was going to preach on Jesus sees and knows. He knows. There's a lot of folks think they're hiding things from God. No, he knows. Mm. But uh, uh, he says uh, in verse 49, Thou art the Son of God, the King of Israel. He comes to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, nobody ever calls Jesus Lord until they trust Him. Hmm? So we see a conversion. What does that mean? Well, first of all, I got a new Lord. He's no longer serving Satan. He knows the God of glory. Then he gets a new life. Hmm? He's no longer a sinner. Now he's been saved by the good grace of God. Now he's a saint. Hmm? Got a new life. My boy, I'm glad I got a new life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Former things passed away. Behold, all things become new. I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not much to look at, but I'm a whole lot better than I was before I got saved. Uh, he got a new Lord. He got a new life. And then he got a new lot. In verse 51, he says, uh, 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 You're going to see angels descending and ascending upon the Son of God. Uh, isn't it amazing the things we've seen since we got saved? Hmm? Just think of the things you've seen in the Word of God. You didn't read it before you got saved. You, had, you bought into the fact that you couldn't understand it. But isn't it amazing what God showed you in the Scripture since you got saved? Isn't it amazing the lives you've seen change? Isn't it amazing the uh, uh, services where you've seen God show up in a wonderful way? Just think about all the things you've seen since you got saved. Hmm? It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Hmm? So, preacher, what are you saying? Nathaniel would have never got to see all that stuff had not Philip had a burden for Nathaniel. Hmm? Who you got a burden for? Are you willing to go and tell them about Jesus? Invite them to come and see what the Lord will do in their life? Hmm? Maybe we need to have a friend day around here. Matter of fact, why don't you just call next Sunday friend day? We ain't going to do anything any different than we do right now. We'll just go say, hey, we're having friend day next Sunday. You're my friend. Will you come to church with me? Here's the, here's the incentive. Whoever brings the most friends, we'll give them a Bible, okay? So, hey, I, I'd like to get a new Bible. Will you come be my friend? Uh, then it'll be legit, you know? We're going to have friend day. Whoever brings most friends gets a new Bible. Now, Miss Mary, you're not going to have any friends show up unless you go ask them. I don't even know if you've got any friends to knowing you. <laughs> Ever since you quit yard selling, all your friends went away. Huh? You know. Ever since she got saved, she lost her friends because, you know, she used to sing that song, she had friends in low places. You know what I'm saying? That was Mary. Huh? But hey, just, just seek you out some folks. Say, hey, we're having friend day. Will you be my friend? You say, that won't work in a million years. Hogwash. Last time we had Friends Day was in the old, old building. Uh, Miss Annette invited a co-worker. Or, well, you weren't even co-workers. They invited a friend that she met through the PTA, and her kids kind of went to school together. And she, just, she said, we're having Friends Day. Can you come to church? I'd like for you to come to church. She said, you know what? We have plans this Sunday. Can I come next Sunday? She said, sure. She came the next Sunday. Brought her husband. I preached on the reality of hell. Her husband had been backslid for about 12 years, got, got right with God, and she got saved by the grace of God. She didn't know that he went up one aisle and she went up the other aisle. You say, did that happen? Yeah, their name's Steve and Vicki Davis. You ever hear them? Friends days work. And you can have Friends Day every Sunday. Just go find you Nathaniel. Said, you're my friend. Will you come and hear about my greatest friend his name is Jesus he's a friend that sticks a close to brother hey just tell them we're having friends today and bite them out it's Christianity at work Philip went you gotta go and when you go you gotta give them something and what better to give them than the gospel what better to give them than you say preacher I, I'm not much of a talker well, that's why we got all them tracks just give them a track 
when you go through the drive through hand, hand to say, hey, appreciate it. Here, read this on your break. Uh, when you see a coworker, say, hey, you, you just look a little troubled today. Let me, let me just give you this. This, this helped me. Maybe it'll help you. Never know, friend. Mm, but you'll never see anything if you don't do anything. You realize there's a special crown in heaven for that crowd that has a burden for sinners and goes and tells them. Why don't you be a Philip? Some might immediately get born again. Some might come out to the house of God and hear preaching a little bit, get born again and, and receive the divine promises of God. And some might realize they've been in church, and they've been saved, but they outgrew the Savior. and They needed to humble themselves and get right with God. You never know. I do know this, if we do nothing, we'll dry up on the vine like every other church that's around doing that. Uh, listen, I, I've said this before. I want to go out in a blaze of glory, don't you? I want to go out on fire for God. I want to not have to bow my head and tuck my tail and be ashamed to stand before the Master when we see Him. I at least I want to be able to say, Lord, I did the best I could. My best isn't worthy of what He did for me, but I still want to do my best, don't you? I wonder, will you put Christianity to work? I've enjoyed all the preaching tonight. I think we need to have an invitation. All this preaching, God might have spoke to somebody's heart. If you're here tonight not saved, why don't you come? We'll take a Bible, show you how to be saved. But if God spoke to your heart, then that's what these altars are for. And really, I don't care if you come to every service or not. Just do business with God when you're here. Are you listening? Maybe tonight, you just want to come tell them you love Him. Maybe you want to be come tell them, thank you for our good church. I mean, we got these good preachers. And thank you, we had church tonight. And I got some help. I don't know. Maybe you just want to tell the Lord you love me. Maybe you need to come and say, Lord, show some, show, put somebody in my heart I can go and invite to church next Sunday that will come. I don't know, but I do know this. The Lord hears and answers prayer. All right. So, Miss Renee, if you'll come, Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. Folks, come to the altar. While folks are coming, let's pray. Father, we thank you for all the good preaching. Thank you for these good preachers. Thank you for our church. Lord, thank you for folks that do go and do come are concerned about folks and invite folks to church and Lord thank you for the folks you've sent to church and Lord we got them come all the way from Milan, Indiana and Rising Sun and Amelia and Lord uh, Glen Esty and God you send folks from all over God we bless you for it now Father have your way in this invitation help your people bless them for being here tonight and God certainly for somebody here tonight not saved help them to come Get saved by the good grace of God, and we'll thank you for it. Have your will and way now, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.